Hello and welcome back to Network Steganography. This chapter will deal with sophisticated hiding methods. And I will go through um, a heterogeneous set of um, sophistication methods that enhance um, covert channels in the sense that they become distributed or more reliable or that they provide new functionalities. Um, so first I want to speak about distributed hiding methods. Distributed hiding methods are those where uh, we uh, distribute the sending process somehow. Um, there is however so far no clear uh, academic definition published um, that describes what is a covert, uh, distributed covert um, channel technique and what is not. However, I hope that the examples that I will show on this and the next few slides um, uh, provide you a rather clear uh, impression of uh, what is meant with distributed hiding techniques in the sense that what uh, that you understand what kind of um, aspects can be distributed. Okay, so the first example that I want to show you is the protocol hopping covert channel, um, also known as multi-protocol covert channel. Um, and here one simply uses different network protocols, in that case HTTP and so on, um, to um, distribute the secret message, in this case hello world, uh, in the way that uh, we put the first two um, letters in an HTTP packet, send the HTTP packet to the receiver, and then the next message might be transferred over a different protocol, in that case ICMP. So what we distribute here is um, our um, message and we distribute it over different a set of different protocols, in this case two uh, protocols. You can also do this in a different way, namely over the protocol channel or protocol switching covert channel. So a PSCC and a protocol channel um, um, refer to the same idea. Um, over the years terminology just changed um, um, to become more precise. Here the idea is that a protocol uh, or the appearance of a protocol is linked to a secret symbol. And um, so while the protocol hopping cover channel can transfer um, any content over uh, by embedding it into, for instance, the, some reserved bit or whatever of a protocol, the protocol switching covert channel works in a way that the protocol itself represents the hidden information. So DNS always represents, uh, in this case, the bit string 1.0. So if I would send three DNS packets, then I would transfer the secret message 1.0.1.0.1.0. And um, here in this case we have four protocols and as you can see all of them refer to a different bit combination. There are some open source implementations of these channels available on GitHub. And however, we can also do this um, using patterns. So if we have our covered sender and the covered receiver, we can um, use a pseudonym, uh, um, pseudorandom number generator to uh, select one of the available patterns of our implementation and then send some new information using uh, a new pattern. Uh, so for instance we could first send some information uh, using the inter-arrival time pattern then with the PDU order, size modulation and so on. Let's have a look um, um, on this taxonomy. So after um, the hiding methods that I have shown you on the previous slide emerged um, people thought about what other things can be uh, hidden uh, in a distributed manner. So, um, and it became clear rather quickly that 
quite a few different combinations are feasible. So first of all um, we have the pattern combination which is the spatial domain distribution of um, uh, the hiding method. So here we have multiple patterns applied to the same packet. For instance we could apply size modulation to increase or decrease the size of an IP version 4 packet but also apply at the same time the value modulation to the TTL field. So we would have two patterns applied to the same um, packet and you could also do, uh, do this with other patterns. For instance let's say you have um, this is the protocol header and here you have some field like the TTL where you apply value modulation and here you maybe have some reserved bit and you apply um, the reserved unused pattern there. Um, so it, there's no limitation regarding the number of patterns you apply, at least not other than the number of available patterns. Then there's pattern hopping, which is the temporal domain distribution. We've already seen this essentially with the protocol hopping covert channel tool. Um, so the protocol hopping covert channel was this one here where we distribute the secret message over different protocols. And um, the idea is you can also do this in a different manner um, where you apply different patterns uh, to succeeding network packets, which is essentially um, pattern hopping. So um, pattern hopping, oops, pattern hopping as you remember was this. So instead of um, switching between protocols, you can switch between patterns. But um, a sample very, uh, an example of pattern hopping can be the protocol hopping covert channel because we can apply different patterns uh, to the different protocols. Okay, so the next thing is pattern variation and that's uh, the main uh, distribution transformation um, and can be done in three different ways. So first of all we have host-based scattering. We apply the same pattern here but uh, to different network addresses. For instance to one host with multiple IP addresses. So um, you encode the hidden information in that case uh, in, um, based on the sender or receiver. There are some sample implementations. These references by the way uh, our reference to this paper because the figure figure is taken from that paper. Then there's flow space scattering and sample implementation is called cloak uh, where you apply the same pattern again but uh, to different flows. So um, um, a sample implementation would also be the protocol hopping covert channel in case you have all the flows going on at the same time. So let's say you have three network protocols and one flow for each network protocol and uh, you distribute your message over these flows. However, here with the flow-based scattering you don't necessarily need different patterns or protocols. It, you already fulfill um, the, the um, uh, condition to uh, have this pattern applied by only having one pattern, the same pattern applied to different flows. So you have different flows, let's say all of them are ICMP and um, you have your pattern X that you apply to all of them uh, to the succeeding network packets. For instance to, you could apply to three HTTP flows the inter-arrival times pattern where you um, um, modulate the inter-packet gap here between the network packets and you do this for all these flows um, simultaneously. That would be flow-based scattering. Protocol-based scattering would be um, that we also again apply the same pattern but to different network protocols. Which would be also a form of pattern variation that I show on the next slide. Um, the blue um, the, the blue marked um, um, 
approaches were already introduced in the computing surveys paper in 2015, partially under different names, but um, originally, this is just a side note, uh, originally pattern variation was more or less defined as protocol-based scattering in that paper here. Okay, so to sum up, uh, let me change color first. So what we can do is we can combine patterns in a way that um, we apply multiple patterns to the same packet. We can also apply pattern hopping where we apply different patterns to succeeding network packets but of the same flow. It's not necessarily different flows. Um, uh, then although it's also allowed that it can be different flows so um, this is why PHCCT is also a form of flow based scattering so it's, it's rather a mixture one could say this belongs to this one and to this one okay so and pattern variation uses always the same pattern so as you can see here it's always the same pattern same pattern and here also the same pattern but we do something different with the same pattern. Either we split the data over different hosts or over flows or over protocols. That's the only thing that uh, matters here in uh, in regards to the um, subcategories here. Okay, so I said one thing, um, namely pattern variation here as a form of protocol-based scattering. And the original idea was as follows. So you take the pattern, let's say this is the um, original LSB pattern which was a part of the uh, value modulation pattern. So um, you have a basic understanding how the LSB pattern, the least significant bit pattern works. I choose this one because it's a simple example. Now um, you have this basic understanding where you know, okay, um, so there is some protocol field with some least significant bit or bits. Let's assume it's this one or this one, depending on the byte order. Uh, maybe it's also two, not just one bit. Uh, and uh, you apply LSB either there or there, depending on the network protocol. So we have some implementations of some network protocol A and B. Let's assume this is IP version 4 and this is IP version 6. Okay, um, now we can describe this pattern in a very gener generic manner. Um, we describe how it works. Um, but what we don't describe it is how we apply it to every network protocol. This is why we can perform a variation of the pattern. So for IP version 4, we modify the TTL. And the TTL is an 8 bit field. So we need to um, say the field has a size of 8 bits and it has some offset from the header. So we have some offset and that's X. Um, that's just the bits from the protocol header uh, that lead to, this, to the start of the TTL field and we might have a byte order. Let's say little or big endian. Okay, so this is all we need to know to apply the TTL, uh, the LSB pattern to the TTL field of IP version 4. And that would be a variation of that pattern where we apply the pattern to some protocol. Now if we want to apply the pattern to a different protocol, in that case IP version 6, then the field is hop, um, the hop count or hop limit field. Um, 
and um, again we define its size I think it's 8 bits and again and the offset from the protocol header so let's say it's Y and we name some byte order and um, so this is all we need to know to apply the LSB pattern to that protocol. We could also define another protocol or take an implementation of another protocol, let's say BACnet, which is a protocol uh, from building automation. So this is a network communication protocol for building automation networks. And again, we perform pattern variation using the pattern and the protocol implementation and the variation would again need some field and in, it's it's called hop I think hop limit or hop count I always mix this with IP version 6 it also has some size and some offset I think it's also 8 byte actually uh, 8 bits actually and some byte order and um, so we can configure um, the pattern variation also for this protocol and for some other protocol of course too um, and we just apply again the general description that is described in the pattern to the specific characteristic of the protocol and that's pattern variation Okay, so this is, these are the distributed hiding methods that I want to uh, show you. And um, the next thing that we need to understand is uh, adaptive, adaptive hiding methods. Um, the first approach that came up here is then, and, and I think the most uh, important one is the network environment learning uh, proposed by Jaroschkin et al. in 2008. Um, so what does it do? Um, the network environment learning allows cover channel nodes to determine how filters in their network environment are configured by probing several cover channel techniques. What does that mean? Um, so, um, in general, you have a covert sender and a receiver. So, what they want to do is sending data to each other. Now, the problem is you might have a filter, like a firewall. And let's assume you can send ICMP packets and UDP packets. And we assume that the ICMP packet um, gets through and is sent to the receiver, while the um, UDP packet might be blocked for some reason, just as an example. So it won't reach the receiver. Now, if the receiver does some passive monitoring here, and records the protocols that arrive, then it can say, okay, I have a list of protocols that I am um, that that I can receive and ICMP is what I see, so I put it on this list. Check. And um now the logic here is that the covert sender and receiver are both acting as peers um equal peers um, and they use the protocols they, that, that appear in the network to transfer information to each other. And that's essentially the network environment learning described by Aroshkin et al. So even if the filter configuration changes and ICMP gets now blocked and UDP would be allowed, after some time the list would be all, uh, modified. Um, and there is a process that is continuously running and that's the network environment learning phase 
that constantly monitors what's going on in the network. So it monitors what protocols are uh, available for communication. As soon as one protocol is found, the so-called communication phase or CC um, or COM phase, some, sometimes it's called COM phase, um, is applied to transfer the secret message because then they know at least one protocol that they can use. So this adaptive technique allows a continuous data transfer even if filter uh, configurations change. Of course it's not as easy as described. Because um, covert sender and receiver might speak different languages in the sense that they have a set of protocols that they can use. So let's assume um, we have protocols ICMP and UDP spoken by the covert sender and some HTTP and ICMP spoken by the covert receiver. Now we assume that the covert sender never receives any UDP packet because it gets blocked and however the ICMP packet is what what it sees so it sends ICMP packet. Um, here this one might speak HTTP and sees HTTP traffic and tries to send data over HTTP and it also sees ICMP packets and tries to send data over ICMP but HTTP might not be understood so this uh, remains a problem unless there is an um, internal signaling mechanism that uh, allows the exchange of such information. Okay, so but this is the initial um, concept of the null phase or the network environment learning. Now, um, as you can imagine, this is a rather problematic to, um, um, implementation uh, because uh, it's error prone and what we need is some more sophisticated method that uh, works more reliable. So uh, because if there is an active warden that uh, between the two hosts that disturbs the communication in a somehow intelligent way then the communication can rather easily be blocked. So let's assume um, um, Oh, of course, this is also what I wanted to mention. Uh, the warden can only block the communication if all covert channels implemented by the sender and receiver are blocked. Um, now, so if there is a traffic normalizer or active warden of any kind that filters the traffic, um, then it, of course, tries to block. It's like a firewall. And so, as described in the standard null phase by from Yaroshkin et al., the covert sender and receiver would nevertheless most likely find some suitable communication protocol that they could exploit for the covert communication. But we can enhance the scenario if we say, okay, um, covert sender and receiver have some advanced setup where they can announce the protocols that they probe over some intermediate node and also tell each other feedback. So that means the covert sender can send some announcement over the intermediate node and tell the receiver that uh, the next packet that it will probe is ICMP. Uh, for instance with the um, code uh, set to um, five or something. So the receiver will receive will configure its filters in a way that it looks for the packet and then the covert sender will send this packet. It either gets through or might get blocked. After some time of waiting, the covert sender sends some feedback to the covert sender. That will then allow the covert sender to have a clear feedback of the current situation. So they don't just passively monitor traffic. Instead, they send announcements and feedback and actively probe and uh, can do this in a systematic manner 
where they probe all their protocols that they understand um, from time to time. For instance, they could probe all them in a sequential manner and after all protocols were tested, they go, uh, they start with the first protocol again. Now, um, this puts the defender, um, the, the active warden, in a weak position uh, because um, uh, of this intermediate node that can be exploited. Um, why is this scenario interesting? Well, first of all, um, and I will show you in a later chapter how we can defend this, by the way. Um, um, so first of all, um, in sophisticated cover channel overlay networks, as we will see soon, the sender and receiver might build up an overlay network. So you have different nodes in the overlay network and you have some some links here but you want to build up new links. Let's assume these are the links that you have in your overlay network. Um, and oh, Wrong tool. And you want to build up this link here. So this new link between the covert sender and receiver now this would then be the intermediate node, but what they want is that between the sender and receiver they want to establish this new link. And of course they take advantage of the fact that the intermediate node exists. And so they can coordinate their actions and give each other feedback over this enhanced null phase. So this scenario with the intermediate node is not the original null phase. It's really the enhancement uh, from 2012 and um, an implementation is available here with an extended description in the documentation uh, on GitHub. So if we have such cover channel overlays then um, and this is um, this was first proposed by Chipiorski et al. Uh, in 2008. Then you can, as mentioned, f build such overlay networks. Um, While well, this figure here is taken from from paper number two, um, was a master's thesis essentially um, at uh, University of Hagen from Peter Bax. Um, who discussed this. So anyway, the first idea by Cipriorski et al. was that you perform some overlay routing. So let's assume these drones here, these these figures here, the, the, these people symbols are our cover channel peers or agents. Now um, if you want to send a message from here to there then the question is how do you get there? And Jibirsky et al. proposed to use random walk algorithm. So they formulated a multi-agent system set up here. Um, that's the MAS part here in the title. And uh, said, okay, we randomly send the data forward. Uh, and it will somehow reach the recipient. Uh, that works. Um, it's not not too efficient, but it works. Um, and this was later improved by Bux with an OSPF-like uh, protocol. OSPF is the Open Shorted Pass First Link State Routing Protocol, where you apply dynamic routing in this overlay network. So the covert channel can have the overlay network can have some overlay routing that um, allows us to have a smart routing based on, for instance, quality of service oriented routing. But there are different advantages that are also there. So first of all, you can bypass firewalls because you do something like the network environment learning, but in, in an enhanced way that also has dynamic routing. So if you know here's a firewall that blocks your communication from this to this agent, then you can this intermediate node because you are aware of it. Um, such a so-called drone uh, can but can also um, not be um, part of the overlay 
uh, or not aware of the overlay network. So for instance, this can be Google Translator. And um, this agent says, okay, Google Translator, translate me the following URL. Um, and that's the address of this system plus some URL parameters where the secret message is encoded. And then the Google Translator would request this website and translate it. But um, the message would then be delivered to the blue system. So this is a smart approach um, and uh, can be used to circumvent filters. Um, that's what meant with that's meant that is what is meant with the utilization of third party nodes. As you can imagine, um, you need some covert channel internal protocol that we call control or micro protocol. So you have a covert channel that is embedded into, let's say, some header field of a protocol. And some part of it, some fraction, must be used for metadata that describe what's going on, dynamic routing and so on. And then there's some part that you can use for the payload. Speaking of these control or micro protocols, they can uh, aid reliability, um, but they can also enhance um, covert channels with several additional means. So first protocol that I am aware of arose in 2004, and that's Ping Tunnel. There are a few more implementations, and we wrote a survey on this. Uh, and, and extended the functionality of such micro protocols a lot. Um, this was part of my PhD thesis and um, uh, turns out you can do of course a lot of things with these protocols and you can also optimize them for coveredness for instance. So they can provide a reliable data transfer because you can have acknowledgements etc like in TCP. You can have session management for your covert transactions. You can say okay the starts and ends and so on. You can also recover sessions if you want to implement that. You can do the covert channel overlay network with own addressing schemes because if you have such an overlay network then you need to um, have some addressing scheme here and if you don't want to use the underlay network addressing and routing then you might call this host uh, host A and this B and so on or give it a number. So you have the dynamic routing and the own addressing schemes. You can upgrade your infrastructure because let's assume this node here has an out-of-date cover channel software then you can um, and let's assume this one has the latest version then it can can upgrade this system with a new version version 2.0 um, transferred over the cover channel which is of course uh, unfortunately very useful for malware then there's peer discovery so while the original null phase just checks what kind of communication is feasible, you can also um, send preambles or sequences of packets where you check for other nodes that announce themselves in the network, for instance. You can switch utilized protocols, of course. Actually, you can perform all kinds of distributed data hiding. And you have the adaptiveness to network configuration changes, and that is essentially the NEL phase. All right, so this is this is um, the general overview of what kind of features such protocols um, can have. There are also formal approaches for designing such control protocols or micro protocols, as well as optimization approaches. I will cover both um, in this chapter. And there are also, but this is just a side note, countermeasures explicitly for control protocols available. See this paper if you are interested in that topic. But I won't go so deep in this class. Um, I think it's um, too specific. 
Okay, so um, the core idea here for designing um, and evaluating such control protocols um, is that we have some underlying network protocol header. For instance, this might be an IP version 4 header. And let's say that we use some fraction of the header to embed steganographic information. This part and this part and so on. So if we combine these, we have this area. Um, different uh, linings here might indicate different patterns. We call these carriers subcarriers. And the combined space is the cover area. So let's assume we place our payload in the lighter part, bit areas and our um, control protocol in the uh, darker areas. Um, and our control protocol might have different components like an egg flag. Let's assume this is an egg flag. This might be a sequence number and so on. So all these puzzle pieces need to fit into this area. As you can imagine, we only have a few bits and we need to be highly space efficient to um, place such data there. So we need to optimize the utilization of available space that we have in our cover area. That also means we want as many features per header bit placed as possible. So we want to exploit every provided bit here as much as we can. Of course we also want this to be upgradable. I mentioned this in a previous slide and it should be able to handle non-covered input. So um, if some other packet arrives that was not sent by the covert sender but contains some potentially uh, interpretable information then we should be able to filter this out. Now let's discuss this again. So we have a, um, a network protocol header and the blue areas are the ones that we utilize. In an old paper we just called this as packet as is just for size. So this, this is the size of the packet of the covert area packet that we can use. Uh, we can also split this over different um, layers if we want to. Of course this um, Ethernet frame here would not be routable over subnets uh, um, because it would be replaced in the next subnet but the rest would be uh, combinable, uh, com uh, exploitable in combination. So let's assume we have a few bits from the IMAP uh, header, a few bits from the TCP header, a few bits from the TCP header and so on and we combine this here um, so that we have um, more space per packet. So if we want to transfer a message of the size S overall overall size of our steganographic message, then we would need a certain number of packets that depends on the number of bits that we can embed per packet. Of course we cannot send half packets so we need to round this up. And twice as many packets if we need an acknowledgement for every packet. For a protocol hopping covert channel that uses n protocols that we refer here as p1 to pn, we can calculate the average amount of data that we can transfer per packet. Um, and that um, we make this depending on the probability of selecting each particular protocol. Now, why is this useful? because we can now play around with this and optimize the covert channel a bit. For instance, for achieving some quality of service or QoS. 
For instance, let's assume we have a password cracking malware that needs to transfer a short password string out of the network once it found one. And let's assume it, it finds one password per hour or something like that because it needs to probe all the hash values of some password file. Um, so the, the idea here or the goal would be to keep a low profile. So we need to transfer only a few packets um, and we need no high throughput or something, but we want to minimize the overhead for this transmission. We want a stealth data leakage. A totally different case would be if we want to urgently, but still a bit covertly, leak some videos of harmed protesters in a country with internet censorship over a covert channel, and we want to leak this information to the press. So let's assume this is a journalist who wants to use the covert channel. So this one to still keep a low profile, but the data needs to send out quickly before uh, his phone is taken away or something like that, or he needs to delete the video quickly and whatever. So he needs also high throughput. Let's see what we could do. If we want high throughput, then we can simply maximize our function f1 here. So what we do is we have again the probability for each protocol and we have the packet sizes. And um, we want to maximize this function under the constraint that the overall probability of selecting uh, all the protocols is 1 and that uh, an M that is rather small is used for minimum threshold for selecting uh, every protocol uh, because we want to give every protocol a chance because otherwise we would only use one protocol namely the one that provides the highest space value but then we don't have a protocol hopping covert channel anymore and the forensic analysis would be more um, um, uh, would be easier because a forensic analyst or stick analyst would need to or also passive warden would need to analyze only one protocol instead of several also we would not be able to route around blocked protocols etc so we are still in the context of sophisticated and distributed hiding methods here. Um, in our paper we suggested a low value um, uh, so that each protocol for instance has at least a chance for selection of one probability uh, one percent. If we want to generate as little overhead as possible though then it's different. So um, one could first calculate a value that is called QI here. That's the size of the pack uh, of the protocol QI divided by the utilizable uh, cover area of that protocol. So that indicates how many bits are transferred overall to send a single covert bit. And then one could simply minimize function F1, uh, F2, where we uh, ut um, involve the QI parameter. Another example that we could do is to optimize stealthiness. Uh, in that case, for each protocol, we would assign it a coveredness level, CY. And um, this coveredness level, um, and again, this would be calculated under the same constraints with um, some minimum threshold. So we would uh, optimize function F3 here with our coveredness value. Um, for instance, the coveredness value could um, depend on how typical the occurrence of a, a protocol of a, of a specific type would be in a typical network uh, or in the environment that we observe using the network environment learning. If we see many, many um, um, streaming data protocols then uh, and many packets of these streaming protocols then we could say okay if we send such a packet then it would not be uh, a big anomaly and we decide it would be a low covertness level that we assign to this protocol but if we would send let's assume an, uh, um, a BGP routing packet um, a high level of all the protocol is not used in the network, then it would not make sense. So the covertness would be uh, very low for such a, um, such a, a protocol. Um, it's not necessary that um, uh, you uh, make CI um, an element of the natural numbers. You can also uh, do this in a different 
manner. Okay, so this is how we could optimize well, in, in an exemplified way the, sec uh, the selection of um, protocols that we exploit for a pro typical protocol hopping or distributed covert channel. But we can also optimize the micro protocol so that we rise, raise fewer attention. In this class, I skip the micro protocol size minimization. See some of my papers on this topic if you're interested. Or some traditional approaches like the compressed serial line interface protocol. This, this has a, an easy to understand header compression uh, mechanism that you can also apply to uh, control protocols, of course. So, but. Um, here I want to show you how you can embold, em, embed the micro or covert protocol in a low intention rising manner into some cover protocol. So what we need to do this is a tailored protocol engineering approach. Protocol engineering is a pretty interesting discipline, a research discipline where well lots of formal methods appeared that allow you to design communication protocols. Inspired by these original approaches, but still done differently because the co context is differently, um, um, we came up with a simple protocol engineering uh, concept. So uh, how does this work? First, we define the COVA protocol. The COVA protocol is the one that we exploit in the underlying network protocol. So let's assume we want to embed it data in IP version 4 again. Then IP version 4 is the underlying network protocol. Out of this network protocol we define a COVA protocol and that's, let me go back to the figure that I sh have shown you. And so this protocol here is the underlying protocol and the, the combined blue area of each protocol is the cover protocol. Okay, so um, and the output of this first step here is the selection of the underlying protocols bits to utilize, which is the cover protocol. Ah, I wrote it here again. Okay, so I think it's clear. Then we evaluate the probability uh, of these particular bits that they are set to zero and one. And we just put them in a list that we call list for the covert protocol. So this is a, this is CPLCP here. Now, the next thing is we design our micro protocol. So we specify a protocol header for it. And the output of this step three is, the, um, is that we have the header bits of the micro protocol. And then we evaluate Again, the probability uh, of these bits being set to 0 and 1, uh, for instance, using a simulation or estimation. Uh, and we store this in a second list that we call list for the micro protocol, LMP. And then we map these lists. So um, we want that the probabilities of the particular bits are matching the particular other bits as closely as possible. But that's not so easy. So let's assume our underlying protocol has 16 bits and we use the gray bits as a cover protocol. Uh, and we call these bits ABC. Now they have, um, they can be set to one or zero. So for each bit, we have two states. Now the micro protocol might also have three bits because uh, the number of bits, of course, needs to be equal. And um, also each bit can be set or not set. Let's say we have an acknowledgement flag, a data flag, and a disconnect flag. flag. Um, now, it might not be always the case that, for instance, like shown for bit C and the disconnect bit, that we have a direct mapping here um, between the bits so that 
if the bit C is set to 1, then it, the disconnect might be set to 0, and so on. So this would match the probabilities in an optimal way, we could say. But maybe uh, it's more uh, the, the, uh, it's, it's, um, uh, the, the, the mapping is more uh, is, is optimal if we match um, the bits or, or map the bits in a way that they overlap uh, the particular original bits as shown here for the case of A and B. Uh, by the way, this symbol here, the red symbol, just indicates that the bit C depends on bit B. So maybe bit C can only be set if bit B is set. Um, I will come to this aspect very soon. So, and then when we have these lists mapped and the mapping is hopefully optimal, we need to verify whether this is actually a good protocol design, not just in sense of probability matching, but also in the sense that our micro protocol does not violate the protocol specification of the underlying protocol. If so, we either terminate the step here, uh, the, the process here, if the um, protocol design is good, otherwise, we need to. Uh, modify either the underlying protocol, for instance, selecting different bits, or modify micro protocol design, or modify the list mapping. So this is the essential process. Now, how can we verify that this design of our or the mapping is good uh, and the design is good? So. Um, one needs to make sure that there are no undesired bit combinations set in the underlying protocol for the micro protocol design. For instance, if the micro protocol would set header flex in the underlying protocol, that would break the standard. For instance, let's assume we have an underlying protocol where we exploit just two bits and one is uh, connect and one is disconnect. And our micro protocol would set this bit to one and this bit to one, and it would not make any sense. And the standard might even prohibit that the connect and disconnect bit might be set at the same time. So this would be a violation of the underlying protocol caused by the micro protocol. The solution is to model both protocols using formal grammar. Um, if you do this with Chomsky type 2 or 3, then you can perform some automated language inclusion test, but this is not important here. Uh, because the protocols are very small, you can usually do this easily by hand. Now, um, let's assume, uh, let's go through an example. So first we define all the rules of our COVA protocol, and we define a grammar for our COVA protocol where we have the typical elements of a formal language, uh, the set of non-terminals, the set of terminals, the set of production rules, and the starting symbol, which is, of course, a, a non-terminal. Then we define the formal grammar of the microprotocol in the same manner. And then uh, we perform a mapping of the terminal symbols in our uh, set of terminals. So for instance, uh, bit A0 might um, uh, represent the non-ACK and a set, bit A set to 1 might represent the acknowledgement being set. Okay, so let's look at these two examples. Um, here we have the covert protocol and the micro protocol and we have some uh, starting symbol um, and we either have um, bit A set to 1 or 0 here, followed by B set to 1 or 0, or we have A set to 1 or 0, followed by the um, uh, non-terminal C, where B is 1 and C 1, or B can be whatever it is, but then C must be 0. Um, and we have some similar rules here, but as you can imagine, they won't match exactly. So what happens then um, is what that we perform a language inclusion test. So we we check whether the micro protocol language specification is a um, language subset of the um, language pr uh, from the grammar of the COVA protocol. And well, this can be done by hand in 
essentially all cases because uh, protocols are very small or in an automated manner check our paper for more details. So um, problem arises if you end up like described here in this uh, extraction from the paper. So um, we need to uh, build sentences for all possible conditions in the micro protocol. For instance, setting flag X and flag Y within the same packet because it's required by the protocol specification. So we could test whether the ACK flag and the disconnect flag can be set within the same micro protocol header without breaking the standard conform behavior of the underlying. To test whether the following sentence of the micro protocol grammar is feasible within the cover protocol grammar. So this one, we set the ACK. Um, we have the disconnect and let's say we have no data. We can also test this with data and let's assume this is mapped in an easy way. So A set to 1 means the acknowledgement is there, B set to 0 means the, means the um, there is no data and disconnect set to 1 uh, means that this bit C is set to 1. So this is this is um, a typical easy mapping. Um, however, our production rules would not allow to create the sentence A1, B, O, C1. We can only have similar uh, results like A1, B, O, C, O or A1, B1, C1. Um, but not this one. That means that acknowledging data and introducing a disconnect at the same time within the covert channel connection is not feasible in our specification that we provided. Now, what if the language inclusion test fails like shown in the previous slide? So we are here and we've seen that, oh, this does not work. So as mentioned, we go back and either we need to modify our microprotocol design. Maybe we can find another solution or maybe we can strike a feature or we need to select other or additional bits from the cover protocol and then not utilize all of them and perform the list mapping again or we can solve this issue by keeping cover and micro protocol the same uh, um, um, uh, as they are but mapping the bits in a different way that is less uh, that is not optimal but still acceptable for us and in that case we can go back in, in any case we, we end up either here again with the list mapping, if we modify one of the two protocols or both, or if we just directly map the lists new, then we can also directly go here and verify the protocol specification again. If you want to model connection-oriented protocols, which is something I've never seen, uh, there are a few hints how this could be done in our paper if you are interested in that. All right, now to finalize this chapter, I want to show you two um, interesting concepts from recent years. And one are network dead drops. As mentioned in network steganography, one can actually only transfer secret data. But there is an exception. You can sometimes also store secret data there, at least for some time. And that's achievable with so-called dead drops. In German, that's Tote Briefkästen. And it's inspired by, um, uh, by, the, by, the, by spy scenarios. So um, um, my PhD student had this idea, and I think it's a good one. Um, Tobias Schmidbauer. And um, so, uh, initially introduced in 2019, the idea is essentially that you exploit network protocol caches. For instance, an ARP cache. How can this be done? So this figure and text is, of course, extracted from the paper. So um, in step A, 
you have the corporate sender and it possesses some secret information and it wants to store the secret information in the ARP cache of, uh, of some network node which we call the dead drop uh, and this information can um, um, then be stored there by manipulating the ARP cache of the dead drop using network steganography techniques in step B. So the covert channel sender exploits the ARP cache of the third party system by sending fake ARP requests uh, containing a MAC IP tuple um, where, as you can see here, um, we introduce covert information. So the actual host reflected by the MAC IP tuple does not exist and represents the secret information. So it's this part here. And um, what we want now is that the dead drop stores the information as long as possible in its cache, but as you know, the ARP cache won't last forever, at least not in typical networks. So the third party host, which is the dead drop, adds the tuple to its local ARP cache, which was step C, and in step D, um, the covert receiver accesses the ARP cache of the dead drop um, by um, uh, reading it using an SNMP-based access. When we analyze um, the lifetime of such um, entries in the ARP cache, then we can see that it highly depends on the operating system. So here's the time in seconds, 160 seconds, 250 seconds, 500 seconds. Um, and that's the number of entries in the cache that you see here. Uh, as shown, the limit here was 140 and here it's 300 in these two cases. So, um, um, And here we have an OpenSUSE system. As you can see, um, Tobias wrote quite some, um, I think 127 or so entries. And once you reach um, uh, more than that threshold, I think 120 something, then they are all or almost all are, are erased and if you write them again uh, and write too many of them they are erased again and so on and but you can continue writing them um, while um, for Windows 7 and 10 uh, the the information that can be kept in the ARP cache is more because as you can see here before the the cache is flushed which always takes place here you can write 250, probably 255 or 56 entries into the ARP cache. But once you reach the number, uh, the ARP cache is flushed. Uh, with Windows 7, uh, 10, Tobias experimented as well. So he saw that the flush takes place somehow here. So he increased the value step by step. And um, to see how long it lasts. And it seems that the entries can last pretty long and only get flushed once you reach the limit. So CS and CR must not necessarily be active at the same time, which is good to keep a low profile. I will add this um, to the slides. I will, I will just add a statement to the slides to make sure this is not forgotten. Okay, so um, there is another thing that I want to show you and that's the last aspect for this chapter and that's reversible data hiding. The core idea here is to modify legitimate traffic from uh, cover from a legitimate sender to a legitimate destination for steganographic purposes in a man in the middle fashion. So the covert sender um, embeds the secret data uh, here in a passive manner and the covert receiver receives the data also in a passive manner. So this is a co passive covert channel. But the covert receiver receives the almost, at least almost, original legitimate traffic because CR also manipulates the traffic here again. 
So that means CR does not only read the traffic, but it also alters the traffic so that it's um, modified in a way that it, its original shape is um, reconstructed. And that's why we speak of reversible data hiding. So the ad advantage of this is that the legitimate destination uh, is barely able to notice the difference between the original and uh, the manipulated traffic. So there are three levels feasible. First of all, fully reversible data hiding, where the secret receiver can completely revert or altered fields of the to, to the original state. So that's kind of perfect um, uh, uh, rever reversible data hiding. So this is what we really want. And um, but there's also quasi reversible where it's not possible to precisely determine the original state of the carrier that was um, modified for the steganographic purpose. Hence, the covertly communicating endpoints can only restore it in a statistical manner. Uh, and there's also non reversibility where the covert receiver has no access to the pro or to proper knowledge required to restore the um, original PDUs or any network statistics. So this is really not what we want when we deal with reversibility, um, but that can be the case. So how can reversibility be achieved? Well, there are three approaches. First of all, intrinsical approaches, um, where the covert receiver can completely restore uh, the over traffic to its original form um, and that's only feasible if the data hiding technique is constructed in a way that allows that. For instance, um, um, if it's always clear that some certain bit has some certain value and that is that the covert receiver is aware of that value or state, then it can say, okay, yes, I can always um, uh, set some header bit that is always zero back to that original state. In the explicit technique, um, um, the covert sender also transmits the state of the over traffic using microprotocol. So the original state plus covert data must be compressed so that it fits into the into the um, um, uh, um, space that is provided and as mentioned here this requires to sacrifice a part of the available bandwidth so nothing in life is for free and implicitly covert receiver restores the over traffic by removing the secret message and by guessing potential original form of the over traffic uh, before the modifications of the covert sender were applied for instance we could estimate the original state or um, um, set the state back to some value based on past traffic observations. All right, so um, what is left is a short summary um, of this chapter. So first of all, I've shown you distributed hiding methods. They make the limitation and prevention of covert channels harder for the uh, stake analyst. They also allow to circumvent filters, for instance, traffic normalizers using network environment learning and the enhanced network environment learning. Uh, also using um, dynamic overlay routing. And then there are covert channel and kernel internal control protocols or micro protocols. They allow reliable and uh, communication, dynamic overlay routing, lots of sophisticated features and especially the combination of distributed um, hiding methods. Uh, so if we combine both of them uh, with um, uh, the distributed hiding methods with the control protocols then we achieve lots of functionality. And other mentionable sophisticated features that I've shown you are dead drops 
and reversible data hiding. So that drops for storing the data for short and midterm time uh, in network protocol caches and reversible data hiding to make the detection of um, steganographic messages at the overt receiver side more challenging. Thank you for your attention.